Thank you for having me, MozCon. I'm so excited to speak here. Um, who here has started their career with the Beginner's Guide to SEO? Yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. I am so grateful to MozCon. I owe them, not MozCon, but Moz, I owe them so much. I owe them my whole career, like for all the content they've produced. Um, so thank you to Moz and the team and all the hard work that you do. Thank you for putting on this amazing conference. So I want to tell a story, and I'm trying to fit 15 years of building teams and marketing teams and consulting marketing teams into 15 minutes. So let's get started with the story. This story is about you, or likely about you. Now, I've met a lot of you at this conference, and I have to say, chances are, if you're sitting here spending three days talking about marketing analytics and SEO and technical stuff, you're probably a marketing badass. Now, you probably didn't start out that way. If you're like most of us, how you describe how you entered into digital marketing, you say, I kind of fell into it. In fact, if you search fell into digital marketing, it appears 51,000 times across the internet. That's how often we fall into this, right? Chances are we probably studied something else in school. But here we find ourselves badasses of digital marketing. We've tried stuff, we've made mistakes, we've learned, we've tested, and we've grown. So much so, chances are that at some point, your boss will come and say, you know what, you're a fantastic marketer. Now go build a team. And just like you fell into marketing, you've now fallen into marketing leadership, which requires a totally different set of skills. So we start building our team, and our team can be our uh, direct reports, it can be our agency, it can be uh, the, the consultants, right? And too many times when we move into leadership roles, we start to apply the same skill sets that made us fantastic practitioners. But if we do that long enough, pretty soon we're going to look and realize, oh crap, we've left our team in the dust, right? And that's not fun for them. It's also not fun for us. Why does this happen? So like, like she said, I, I work in, in uh, education a lot. And I learned that only one third of accredited universities offer two or more classes in digital marketing. And who knows if they're any good, right? But only a third even offer it. That's right now. And complicating things is marketing is a mix between art and science. As much as we like to pretend that this is, is a science that we can test and experiment and always get reliable results, that's wrong. This is also an art form. And that makes things really confusing and sometimes really scary. So much so that only 9% of marketers strongly agree that their marketing is even working. Like, don't tell the CEO that. And only half of marketers feel highly proficient in our jobs. Like, that's sad. Like, we don't, ha we don't know what we're doing, half of us, right? That creates a lot of burnout. So I kind of feel for that. That's, that's a hard place to be sometimes. So I've concluded in my time building and coaching teams that the thing teams need more in digital marketing than any other space to build world-class teams is how well we as leaders can develop trust. This is crucial. Trust means, well, let's, let's get into that a little bit. But the reason that's so crucial is like, think about what's happening outside of this economically, politically. That's scary. On top of all the stuff we already talked about. And building trust is not saying, I trust you. If you say, I trust you to your team, you just said, good luck. You got this. You're on your own. Do not say I trust you. So how do we develop team uh, trust on a team? We're going to have about three things today. So one is focusing only on results. Number two is closing feedback loops. And number three is removing barriers to risk taking. So first, focusing only on results. I love this graphic. I've used this a billion times. I talk about this all the time. This was originally made by Rand Fishkin, talking about a conversation between Dharmesh and Elon Musk about how people on a team are vectors and they all point in different directions and they have different strengths or units of productivity. So the goal as a leader is to align all those vectors between where we are and where we want to go and deciding what the units of productivity are. How is the team measured like uh, uh, in, in terms of productivity? So <clears throat> there, sometimes as a leader, when we are new, we rely on old units of productivity, old ways of measuring results. Things like how many hours are you spending? Where are you working? How hard are you working? What deliverables are you producing? All of those are kind of surface level, not meaningful results. When really what we should be focusing on is what are the outcomes? What happened because of your work, regardless of how long it took or what deliverables you produced? That's what a real leader should be focused on, especially in marketing. So not hours. It doesn't matter when you work, where you work, how hard you work, or how, uh, like what kind of deliverables you produce. It's what results happen. 
So let's tell a story about that. E-File Cabinet, <clears throat> they're a client of ours. We love these guys. We've been working for them for years. What they do is their document management system. They take all your paperwork, digitize it, and deal with the like, automation of it. And they came to us initially. Their SOW was like, hey, we want you guys to work these number of hours. We want this traffic. We want this content. And we want some better rankings. So we said, okay, let's do that. We built a bunch of landing pages, a bunch of content. We built some content that was gated behind landing pages to produce MQLs. We built a complex email marketing funnel to drip and nurture those uh, leads. And it like worked, but it was like, okay. It was best practice, right? And these days, best practice is synonymous with mediocre or average. So you have to do beyond best practice, right? You have to go beyond that. And so we thought, well, what do they really want? What are the results they really want? And we had a, dram, a jam session with their CEO, their VP of marketing, their VP of uh, uh, sales. And we said, like, tell us what's going on in the organization. And we learned a couple things. One, they want to increase market share. They had huge competitors coming and trying to eat their lunch. They wanted more revenue. And they had a giant sales team and not enough leads coming in to feed their whole sales team. So their sales team was, like, really agitated. And then they had a board that was putting a lot of pressure on the CEO to see growth. Uh, and then finally, their biggest audience or their best audience was or, uh, uh, accountants, uh, but they weren't really well known among accountants. So we said, okay, how can we help these guys? And we got on the phone with a bunch of accountants, with a bunch of their customers, and we started to learn about them, what makes them tick and what they deal, uh, what they deal with day to day. And we learned that they love their job, but they hate dealing with all the paperwork, specifically the stuff that works with paper, like printers, copiers, fax machines. We also learned that there's a lot of huge conferences for accountants that happen all across the United States where they gather together. So we said, let's build the world's first mobile rage cage and put it in these conferences, and let's fill it with printers and fax machines and copiers, and then give them a bat and let them go nuts. This is, this is SEO. This is content marketing. This is ads, but it's doing it in a weird way. So they came in, they signed their waiver, they got into our hub spot where we could then nurture them later. We suited them up. By the way, this is Matt. This is our content marketer, the guy, on the, uh, the guy in the blue shirt. Uh, he's producing content. He's just not doing it with a keyboard. Uh, <clears throat> and then we also stuck a camera inside the room where we recorded them. And we said, hey, we're going to email you your video later. Whoever's video gets the most votes wins $1,000. So it turned them all into evangelists for our campaign, getting all their accountant friends to come and vote for their video. And they went crazy. It was awesome. They loved it. And it taught them that e-file cabinet, our marketing gets you this much. Just imagine how much our product gets you. It got so much attention that we earned a bunch of press because of this. We earned a bunch of links organically. The news came out and covered it. And in case you're interested, we recycled everything so it was environmentally friendly. So did we get the surface results? Yes, we did. But we didn't do it in the normal way. We did it in a different way that helped get the true desired outcome, which is increasing their market share. We improved their revenue 85%, and their investors were super stoked. And in my opinion, the best thing that this did was it taught accountants that e-file cabinet is, is like, we get you. Okay, so once we get our team to focus on the true results, the true desired outcomes, the next step is to close feedback loops. Let's imagine that we're on a hike. I love hiking. We're on a hike up in the mountains, and we come across this pristine lake. It's glass, not a single ripple, the whole thing. And oh, by the way, my son is there. This is my son, Pierce, my oldest. He turns seven in two days, so happy birthday to him. Now, he's also pretty rambunctious. So if you know seven-year-olds, what is that seven-year-old going to do when they come upon a lake that is clear as glass and, and not a single wave. What are they going to do? Jump in it, throw it. Yeah. Well, my son will find the nearest rock and he's going to throw that in. Okay. Now, if you know my son, what is the next thing he's going to do after smalling, throwing a small rock in? Yes. He's going to think about it and hmm. <laughs> this is not Pose, by the way. He's just like this mischievous. He found a big rock, and he throws the big rock in. Small rock, small splash. Big rock, big splash. He's acting, and he's analyzing, changing how he acts and analyzing the outcome. This is a feedback loop. It's crucial to how we grow as people. It's built into us. No one was paying him to throw rocks in the lake. He wanted to do it. So feedback loops show us traction, and that provides motivation to keep going. When we don't feel like we have traction, that causes burnout. Burnout has less to do with the amount of work that we're doing and more to do with the amount of traction we feel we have in our lives. So think about that. 
So think about on your team, are there situations where someone doesn't have traction because they have a broken feedback loop? Why does this happen? On marketing teams, it's so complex. We have lots of people from different backgrounds. We've got your ads people, we've got social, we've got content, CRO. And then we have the designers sitting over here, bonjour. <laughs> and they're all asking for different things from different people. I need these ads, I need this copy, I need this article, I need these changes made, right? And they start to develop blinders. And those blinders eventually over time produce silos to the point where everyone is acting independently on the same account, same campaign, but they're acting as individuals. And worse, they're even analyzing as individuals. Sometimes the content marketers are just looking at traffic and time on page and conversions. PPCs looking at ROAS, SEOs, sometimes just looking at rankings and conversions. And then designers, poor designers, they're like, man, I hope somebody liked that ad, right? I hope, I hope it worked, you know? They just kind of designed something and then went off into the ether and they never heard about it again. And where you don't have that feedback and that analysis, that creates stagnation, low performance, and burnout. Where you have that analysis and you have more of it, that's more growth, more motivation, more autonomy, which is what we need if we're going to create a stellar marketing team. So how do we close feedback loops? Number one, you have to identify all the contributors. <clears throat> that's not just your direct reports, but that's your management, that's your consultants, that's your agency. And then ask yourself, do any of these people, are they struggling to improve? Are they stagnant? Are they not growing? Then number two, do all of these contributors know the full impact of their work? Do they know how their actions impact other people or impact the desired outcome? And if not, is it because they don't have access to the data? Do they not know why? Or if they do have access to the data, perhaps they don't know how to interpret it. In my opinion, everyone in digital marketing, whether you're a designer, content marketer, SEO, or ads, you have to know Google Analytics at the very least. You should be able to interpret that information. And the last is, as much as is possible, you need to automate this feedback. We, like, often we know good leaders provide feedback. Hey, you did a good job here. Or hey, this could have improved, here's how. That's a good thing, you should do that. But that is not the feedback loop I'm talking about. If your entire team's feedback loop relies on you remembering to tell them whether something went well or didn't, that's gonna break, no matter what. So they need automatic feedback loops. This has to be as consistent and as devoid of feeling as an echo, right? You speak in a cave and you get the echo back. Speak and response, act and response, act and response. There's no feeling, it's just I act and something happens. And so how do you do that? You set up, you know, customer alerts for the entire team, everyone on the team, Moz, stat notifications, CRM alerts, uh, Google Data Studio. You should have a team dashboard that your team is analyzing together. If you do that, then you'll suddenly see a team that will start acting together and they start analyzing together, sharing bits of information from their different disciplines that are relevant to each other. One cool story of this is EOS. They do those chapsticks and those little balls. And our content marketer was producing a bunch of personas for them <clears throat> and putting them into the funnel in, in different stages. And she learned something that was really cool. She said, all these personas seem to be interested in this thing, zodiac signs. That's interesting. Then the SEO specialist came and said, well, let me do some analysis on this and saw like, tons, tons of keyword volume around that. And a lot of the organic content I'm seeing pairs products with zodiac signs. That's kind of interesting. And the ad specialist said, well, I have the ability to target people based on their interest, number one, in zodiac signs, and number two, I know their birthday, so I know what their sign is. So what we did is we paired all of the EOS products with different zodiac signs, and then targeted them to people who were interested in zodiac signs based off of their sign. And as a result, we increased purchases 42%. And that set of ads had 118% higher return on ad spend than all the other campaigns that EOS was running at the time. All thanks to the team sharing bits of information that they didn't think was interesting alone, but together produced this cool campaign. Okay, the last is removing barriers to risk taking. This is one of the most difficult, but one of the most fun and rewarding parts. When we take risks, there's a lot of fear involved. And there's a lot of fear on your team. I can tell you right now, there's a lot of fear on your team. So it's our job as leader to reduce that. How do we do that? We don't tell them it's gonna be okay. The way you do it is you understand what the full risk is that they're bringing to you. If they're coming to you with a solution, we wanna say like, hey, yeah, you got it, go for it. I love the idea, go for it. But what we should do is understand the risk, what is at play here, and then understand in depth their solution. Poke around, ask questions. And then once you've done that, you've communicated, I've taken the time to understand this, 
And then if it doesn't go well, we both share the burden of the responsibility on this. So go for it. I believe in this. That is being a true leader. Think of it as a slack line or as a, a, a tightrope. When you're the practitioner, you're the person walking the tightrope. When you're the leader, you are now the tightrope. The tightrope shows us where we were and where we were going, what the destination is, what the goal is. It also provides support and guidance. And then if you'll notice, she'll have that safety harness to know, if I fall, if this doesn't go well, I'm not going to die. It's going to be okay. You're not going to fire me if this doesn't go well, right? And that's the role of the tightrope. And that should be your role as a leader of a high-performing team. I'm going to end on the story of Tuck the Needle. If any of you are in mattresses or no mattresses, you know that in 2020, for some reason, pandemic hits, we all get obsessed with toilet paper, and for some reason, mattresses. Mattress sales, March, you look at it, March, mattress sales, boom, through the roof. It's crazy. And then March, and then 2021 came, and mattress sales started to tank, because we don't need it anymore. We're, we're full of mattresses. So, so sales started to dwindle, despite, you know, we were doing SEO, we were doing ads and all that good stuff for them, and we, like, sales were still going down, which was, like, scary for the team internally, because they don't want their jobs cut or their budgets cut. It was scary for us, because we didn't want to lose them as a client. And the team alone came up with a solution. It was like kind of a Hail Mary. They said, hey, we think this will work. We know what your values are to create, connect, and nurture. We know who you are, and we know who your audience is. They target a lot of new parents because that's the time typically when you're buying a new mattress and they need a lot of rest. So what we pitched to them was doing an internship where the parents could apply to intern, test out a new mattress, and it was like a job. So we created a job landing page where they could apply. We then reached out to partners uh, to co-market with Calm, Storybook, Aura, Snooze to share their product and tap into their audiences. We built out an entire course with J.D. Valia. Uh, uh, sleep course, and then we produced a ton of content, email marketing, whole funnel campaign, a bunch of ads, and uh, while all the competitors were decreasing in their total sales, Tuft & Needle saw a 57% increase in revenue and 35% increase in conversions because they took this swing, this big expensive risk. So <clears throat> when you think about uh, creating a high-performing team, think about these three items. In the end, it's about developing trust. It's giving people a safe space to take risks, do things that are weird, go beyond best practice, and try things. And if you do that, you're going to convert your marketing team from this into this. People that will adapt. People that will autonomously make decisions that are going to be for the betterment of you and for your client and for your company uh, and your team. They will have your back doing stuff that you've never seen before, that the industry has never seen before, and we need that. We need more leaders. Leaders have an impact that lasts forever. Campaigns come and go, but the leaders make more leaders, and that's what our industry needs, and that's what I invite you to do. Thank you. Thank you.